Uh, I'm Henry Fuchs. I'm uh, happy to be able to welcome you to uh, today's uh, distinguished lecture. Um, as you all know, we are pleased to have uh, one of our PhDs back, uh, Mark Lavoie. I received his PhD here in 1989, if memory serves. I think most of your uh, committee is still here in the audience. <laughs> um, before that, um, Mark uh, has a, a degree in architecture and a master's in computer graphics from Cornell, if memory serves. Uh, he's uh, now a professor of uh, computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford. And uh, many of you know him from lots of uh, stellar achievements. Um, those of you who are young may not know of some of these, uh, but even before he came to Chapel Hill, uh, he was famous in circles for uh, creating perhaps one of the first computer graphic systems that was used in production in entertainment uh, for uh, Hanna-Barbera, uh, which was used for many years, which was a result of his uh, master's uh, thesis at Cornell. Um, he did this station here in 89, and he has done a tremendous number of things since then. Um, although he will not talk about it much, um, you should all know, if you're too young, that he led the uh, Digital Michelangelo Project, uh, which digitized um, David and uh, some other famous uh, statues, as I recall, to the level where you could see some of the uh, marks, chisel marks, that were left on it, which is a phenomenal success. Um, I don't want to take up any more time. Uh, oh, I should say that he's received many awards over the years, uh, among which are the uh, um, ACM SIGGRAPH Achievement Award. Uh, he's also an ACM Fellow. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember a bunch of other ones. Uh, his uh, undergraduate <laughs> thesis, I think, was the best of the year. I mean, it goes on and on. I don't want to take up any more time. It's a pleasure to have Mark here. Mark Lavoie. So indeed, most of my committee is here in this room. In fact, uh, when we sat down with them for breakfast, I had this sudden flashback and a shiver down my spine. This was my PhD committee reconvening. Because the first time they convened, they failed me. I actually failed my uh, PhD thesis uh, meeting here, uh, in particular because uh, Fred um, listened to my proposal on volume rendering and said, where's your data come from? Tell us about your data. What do you know about it? And I didn't know about, is it not on? And I didn't uh, know about computed tomography, and I didn't know about protein crystallography, and so they sent me back to read some books in the second time I passed. And it was one of the best things they ever did, and I use that as a lesson for my students. <laughs> so, with that, uh, let's start. So my current research area is in general computational photography. And uh, one branch of computational photography is the sensing and display of light fields. And that's what I'll be talking about today. It's light field photography and microscopy. So the first thing I should do to kind of bring everyone up to speed is define what a light field is. So I'll have a, just a couple of theoretical slides about light fields. Most of the talk will be about applications of light fields, as you'll see uh, in a moment. All right. So. What is a light field? If you talk about geometrical optics, in other words, you forget the wave nature of light, then it's light traveling along a straight line, light traveling along a ray, in other words. And the measure of that is, in, is radiance. And so if we think about a tube of light, then it is going to be watts per meter squared, which is the cross section of that tube. And if you consider any differential length, then this solid angle, which is measured in steradians, makes it then watts per meter squared to radian. So just think about an amount of light traveling through a tube. And there are different positions of tubes and different angles of tubes, and that makes up the light field. In fact, if you enumerate those dimensions, there is x, y, z for position. And then in any position, there are two angles that specify the direction of the tube. And so it's a five-dimensional function, sometimes called the planoptic function. However, in areas of space that are free of occluders, the amount of light traveling along this ray is the same as this is the same as this. That turns out to reduce it exactly one dimension. And so it's really just a four-dimensional function, but it's not so obvious how you would parameterize this four-dimensional function. 
So people have proposed a number of parameterizations for the 4D light field. One of them, you might imagine, would be take a plane with XY position. At any point on that plane, imagine a direction of light, which would be two angles, theta and phi. And so that would be one parameterization of the light field. Another parameterization you might imagine would be take a sphere, choose two points on the sphere. So latitude, longitude of the first point, latitude, longitude of the second point, draw a ray between them, and you can enumerate the light field that way. This one has one nice characteristic that if you randomly choose these points on the surface of a sphere, you will uniformly parameterize the entire light field. You have an equal chance of measuring the light in all directions and positions. The, one, the parameterization that I'll talk about today is the two-plane parameterization that Pat Hanrahan and I proposed in 1996. The idea here is to take two planes in general position. You've got U and V on one plane, S and T on another plane. Choose a UV ST quadruple, and that denotes one ray of light going through the space. All right, so that's all I'll say about uh, light fields in general. Most of this talk will then about, be about devices for recording light fields. So one simple way of capturing a light field is just take a video camera and walk around an object like this Volkswagen. And if you took uh, a view at each one of those nodes, then this is a light field. Most of the light fields that I'll be talking about today will be more organized, such as an array of cameras uh, or an array of micro lenses that have been put inside a handheld camera or a similar array of micro lenses that have been put inside a microscope. And so the major application for this, as you'll see shortly, will be refocusing of images after we've captured the, the light field. You might notice a trend here between large and small scenes. Here are the three devices that I'll talk about. And then I'll also talk about creating light fields. So this is some new unpublished work uh, where we use a video projector and a micro lens array to be able to generate 4D light fields at fine resolution. All right, so let's get started with the first one, which is the Stanford multi-camera array, which captures uh, a light field by having a grid of cameras. So basically, it's just 100 webcams, except that the 100 webcams have a couple of unique architectural characteristics. Well, they're all synchronized, so we can fire them all at once or fire them in sequence. That they can continuously stream from all 100 cameras at once. That's a lot of data. So we have a, a supporting electronics board per camera the key feature of which is an MPEG encoder chip to be able to reduce the bandwidth. And then it has a flexible physical ar arrangement so we can move the cameras around. So standing in front of uh, this arrangement is the, uh, my collaborator, Professor Mark Horowitz, and his PhD student, Bennett Wilburn. And each one of these nodes is one camera. Here's a tighter arrangement uh, where they're placed basically as tight as they can be to simulate a single perspective viewpoint. Of the several applications we've worked out for this camera array, I'll show you just one, which is relevant to the rest of this talk, and that's the application of synthetic aperture photography. So the idea is very simple. You have a point in the world, and any optical system will bring it to a focus point there, whereas a point off this plane will be brought to a circle of confusion on the other side. Now, as any photographer knows, if you make a smaller aperture here, then you've got a smaller circle of confusion here, and so a wider range that is in focus here. Conversely, if you make this really large, so you make the circle of confusion larger, you make the range of things that will be in focus or the depth of field shallower. In fact, if you make this really, really large, then stuff that's over here, as long as it's smaller than the aperture, meaning as long as it's smaller than the lens, doesn't actually occlude your vision. So this is something Leonardo observed 500 years ago, that if you hold a needle very carefully in front of your <laughs> eye, that because the needle is smaller than the pupil of your eye, it doesn't actually block any part of your vision. There are viewing rays that go around it. And what it does then is it simply lowers the contrast. It adds a little haze to every single pixel that you see of it. And we'll see that effect shortly here. So it may be inconvenient to actually have a large aperture, but we can simulate it with an array of cameras. So suppose we wanted to make a focused view of this spot here. What we would do then is select those pixels from each of these cameras, possibly with interpolation, that see that point and just add their colors together. And if we do that, then we get one pixel in this synthetic approximation 
of the real large aperture. And we do that for every point on this plane, and then we get a full image. So here we are outdoors. Uh, we've got telephoto lenses on the cameras. Uh, we're going to look from the electrical engineering building here over to the computer science building across the street. We're going to look through these bushes after removing that calibration target. On the left, here's what one camera sees. And on the right is if you add all the camera's images together. So before you add them together, suppose you were to shift them. So the way perspective works, if you shift them by a certain amount toward each other, you can get objects at one particular depth to align, therefore to essentially be in focus. Whereas objects in the scene that are closer to the camera won't have been shifted enough. They won't align, they'll be out of focus. Objects that are beyond that nominal plane will have been shifted past each other, and they also won't align, and so they'll be out of focus as well. By changing the amount of shift, you can change the depth of objects that are in focus. And here's what that looks like. So we're focusing synthetically on the bushes, across the street, through my grad students, into the building, and there's a step stool in the building. So there's no magic here. My students are visible in each one of these shots. You can see a little bit of sneaker here and maybe a spot of t-shirt here. All we're doing is we're taking each of those little holes through the bushes and aligning them to fill in a sharp view of my students. Let me run that again. And so because they're smaller than the synthetic aperture, the array of cameras, we can see through stuff that way. Um, and yes, this was funded by DARPA. Question? Uh, now, when you, when you described the left field originally, you said that you could reduce it from a 5D to a 4D because there were no blocking things along the rays. And yet here what we're doing is we're saying there's an occluder along each ray. I mean, essentially, at some point, there's an occluder that right. that ray sees. Right. But does that at all affect? Yeah, well, what that means is that I can't see what is behind one of these leaves in the continuation of that same line of sight. I'm not proposing that I can see that. So it's still just a four-dimensional function. Wherever that ray does eventually stop, that's the end of my light field. Good question. OK, so let's go down in scale, talk about the handheld camera. So this is a PhD student, Ren Ning, who worked with Pat Hanrahan and I. And his design was very simple. He took an ordinary uh, camera, moved the sensor back, and placed a micro lens array in its place. So the idea here is that rays that normally come together in a single pixel essentially uh, it, it pass through the micro lens array and are recorded by different pixels. So we're now separately recording each one of these rays that normally are confused together. Another way to think about it is the micro lens arrays create a focused view here of the back of the main lens of the camera from the inside of the camera. So there'll be a sequence of these little circles here that are pictures of the main lens of the camera from different points of view. So um, another way to think about it is it's a light field. Here's our UV plane. Here's our ST plane. And for every UV ST, we're separately recording this ray at some resolution. So here's how the prototype was constructed. We just took a medium format camera, took it apart. You can see the sensor there. We placed a micro lens array in place. So the micro lenses are just square sided spherical caps. So these are not the same micro lenses that are in most consumer cameras, one per pixel of the camera in order to gather light to the sensitive part of that pixel. These are larger. Uh, for example, they might be 14 by 14 pixels under each lens. And so their functionality is going to be different here. So if we have a 16 megapixel sensor with this many lenses, as you'll see shortly, we're going to produce final images that are just about 300 by 300. But we've recorded, so that's the spatial resolution, but we've recorded this much angular resolution. And I'll show you how we can use that shortly. First, let me show you what it looks like just after we've taken the picture. So this is the picture straight out of the camera of some crayons. And if we zoom in on this, it looks spatially like the crayons, but you can see it's composed of these little disks. And if we keep zooming in, each one of these pixels here is the angular information of one ray, normally not captured by a photographic camera. But we've recorded this at the expense of some spatial resolution. So what can we do with it? So the main thing we can do is digital refocusing. 
if we were to just take all the pixels in a disk and add them back together again, then we will have reconstituted an ordinary focused image focused here as if we didn't have the micro lenses in place except that the image will be lower resolution. The more interesting case is suppose we wanted to focus here. So the way optics works, that would mean that we would need a sensor here. We don't have a sensor here, but we've recorded the light field over there. And so by just combining, for example, the lower pixel from this disk, that's this ray, the middle pixel from this disk, that's this ray, and the upper pixel from this disk, that's this ray, we have approximated having had a sensor here, which approximates focusing here. And that's all there is to it. It's just resampling or, uh, the light field and adding some pixels together. So here's what that looks like. We're at a party, we're focused on her, but by changing which pixels we add together, we can change the focus to him, to her, and then so on back. So here's one of my favorite examples. It's an autofocus camera. It, it accidentally caught the Venetian blinds, as these autofocus cameras often do. But we've recorded enough extra information that we can fix the focus after we take the picture. So another thing that we can do is we can extend the depth of field. So here's the way the argument goes. If you have a camera with its aperture wide open, you'll get something in focus. So in this case, I guess she's in focus. She's out of focus. Here's a blow up here. Suppose we wanted everybody to be in focus. So any photographer would know that a reasonable way to do that is to stop down the aperture, for example, from f4 to f22, which is a smaller aperture. The problem with that, although it increases the depth of field, is it lets less light in. That'll make a dark picture. If you were to expand that dark picture, it'll make a noisy picture. So here's what that looks like. Everybody's in focus. It's taken at f22, but she's noisy because not much light got in. With the light field camera, what we're saying is open it back up to f4, subdivide those pixels into subpixels, something very, very fine, and capture a value for each one of those subpixels uh, with a micro lens array over it, and then focus sequentially at a sequence of depths, so create what's called a focal stack, and now run what's called an all-focus algorithm. So an all-focus algorithm goes through each pixel, looks at every slice in the stack, and says which is the sharpest by some central difference operator, for example. And whichever is the sharpest is the most in focus. And it does that for every pixel in the image. Those are called all-focus algorithms. Here's what a typical result looks like. This is uh, from the digital photo montage paper. So everybody's in focus. And because the aperture was wide open, we let in a lot of light. It's not noisy. So that's the idea of extending the depth of field uh, using this technique. So let's go down again in scale. We're headed toward the microscope. Uh, in macro photography, we can get, of course, great refocusing because we're really close to our object. You can see that there. There's something else interesting we can do in, in macro photography. Suppose instead of adding together a bunch of pixels, uh, we only considered one pixel. So that one pixel is this ray here. If we considered the same pixel in all of the disks here, that would be this ray and this ray. In other words, a whole family of rays that go through that one point on the lens. In other words, a perspective view of the scene as viewed from that point on the aperture. So what would it be like to take the lower pixel from each one of these disks? So that's this ray. And if we took the same pixel from every one of those, uh, the same pixel from every other disk, it would be this ray and this ray and this ray. In other words, a perspective view of the scene as viewed from this point on the aperture. So just by extracting a single pixel from each disk and a different pixel from all of the disks, we can change the view, the perspective viewpoint. So if we're looking at distant mountains, it doesn't make much sense to move the viewpoint across a, a camera lens. But if we're looking at something that's close up, we can get a fairly dramatic effect that way. So here's what that looks like with our macro lens in place. So we can just move the perspective viewpoint back and forth. So this, these are not rendered images. So there's never going to be a mistake, an occlusion mistake or a shading mistake here. We're just extracting different slices from the four-dimensional light field. Or we can take the lower pixel from one disk and an upper pixel from another disk, and we get a virtual telephoto view with a viewpoint down here, or a virtual wide-angle view with a viewpoint up here. And so we go back and forth between those two. It's sort of the Alfred Hitchcock vertigo zoom dolly effect. 
Okay? So finally, we come to the microscope, which has been uh, something I've worked on for about the th last three or four years. The idea here is going to be almost the same as the handheld camera. So for those of you who don't know how a microscope is constructed, it's basically a really powerful lens that creates an image in the sense of an ordinary lens on something called the intermediate image plane. So if you think of an old style microscope with a barrel, this is, intermediate image plane will be right in the middle of the barrel. Um, so there'll be some magnification, the ratio between these two lines here. A compound microscope, a mod any modern microscope, also has an eyepiece which offers additional magnification and presents the image focused at infinity, meaning parallel rays here, so you can view it as if you were looking at a distant object. So let's forget about the eyepiece. We'll just take the lower half of the microscope, and then what we'll do is we'll put the microlens arrays at that intermediate image plane. So otherwise it operates exactly like the camera did. So a single point in the field of view will create a small disk up there. Adjacent points on the field of view will create their own little disks up there and will create this image that we can then uh, refocus or get oblique views on. However, there's a gotcha in the microscope that didn't hit us in the case of the camera, and that's diffraction. So let's think about diffraction. Talk to any microscopist. He can tell you what the resolving power of his microscope is just by knowing the numerical aperture of his objective. So this particular objective is 0.95 NA. So if you're a photographer, you'd rather think about that. The reciprocal of this, or 1 over 2 times this, is the F number. So if you convert this, that is an F.51 lens. So you can't go to Adorama and buy a f.51 photographic lens. It's an amazing, microscope objectives are amazing pieces of optical equipment. They're highly corrected. They've got 13 to 17 glass elements in them. This particular objective can capture light from the optical axis down to 70 degrees on each side of the optical axis. It's an amazing aperture. Um, nevertheless, given that numerical aperture, and Abbe's formula and the wavelength of light, let's say half a micron, uh, which is green light, you can uh, compute what the number of resolvable spots in each direction will be for a given sensor size or a given field number, as it's called on the intermediate image plane. Then in the, in the microlens array case, we can put a microlens array over it and we can partition that into this much spatial resolution and this much angular resolution. But the product of those two cannot exceed this. So another way to think about this is there's a propagating wavefront coming through the microscope. And there's an information content of that propagating wavefront. And the, uh, the discoveries of Fourier physics tell us, uh, Fourier optics tell us that we cannot exceed the information content of the propagating wavefront. We are free only to interpret it as spatial or angular resolution, but we cannot exceed it. So the first thing I have to tell a microscopist is if this is the partition they chose, then they're going to get about three micron things they can resolve instead of quarter micron things that they can resolve. So they won't be looking at small structures within a cell. They'll be looking at multicellular organisms or large cells like neurons. Um, they can make a different trade-off. They could say 600 by 600 with only uh, 4 by 4 um, angular. And we'll see what that trade-off leads to in just a moment. So here's our prototype. Uh, the microlens array is there in that circle. And let me show you what a, a light field looks like here. So this is a little speck of crayon wax that's coming out at us. Here's what the light field looks like for that. So spatially, it's going to look like the piece of crayon wax. But if, again, if we zoom in here, each one of these pixels is the angular information for one ray just as it was in the macroscopic case, normally not recorded in a microscope. So before I tell you, before I show you some light field renderings, there's something about the geometry of a microscope that you need to know that's different than a photographic camera with which you may be familiar. If we were to analyze this as if it were a photographic camera, here's what we might say. We might say, all right, a point on the specimen, will come to a focus way up there at the top of the room. A point over here will come to a focus sort of on the right side of the room there. And that's the way photographic cameras work. So one way you can think about, these are blur cones, 
A photographer would be comfortable with this. Things would be in focus here and would go out of focus if you move them up. A photographer would also say you can think of it as being a line of sight, which is the centroid of that cone, plus at each distance away from the in focus um, plane, some circle of confusion. So if you think of it as lines of sight and circles of confusion, what are the lines of sight of this photographic lens? Well, it's obviously the centroids of those cones, which look like that. They come together at a point. That point is the perspective viewpoint of the lens. And so it's on the first principle plane of the optical system. However, this is not the way a microscope works. A microscope has an extra diaphragm called a telecentric stop. It's one focal distance behind that first principle plane. Its effect is to block some of the rays. Now, that didn't do anything terribly interesting in the case of the center of the field of view, but look what it does to the edge of the field of view. It blocks out, in particular, this ray here. So what happens if you block out that ray? Look at the centroids of the cones now. The cones are the sh same shape. Their centroids are parallel. So what does it mean for the centroids to be parallel? There is no point of perspective in a microscope. It's not a perspective device. It's an orthographic device. So if you go to any textbook on microscopy, you won't see the word orthographic written in the textbook. This is something we computer graphics people might think about. But a microscopist would, of course, know that when they translate the specimen left to right, they don't see the sides of stuff. There's no parallax in a microscope. Whatever's above something else will stay above it as you translate the stage. A microscopist will also know that as they focus something, it doesn't change size. It doesn't grow as you focus it. That's true in a photographic lens. It changes size. Not very much. It's not the same as zoom. When you focus, sorry, a camera. When you focus a camera, things change size very slightly. That's especially true in the macro regimes when you're focusing. Another weird effect of this telecentricity is that the size of this piece of glass here has to be the size of the aperture, which is this cone, plus the size of the field of view, or otherwise the light won't be able to enter the aperture. That's not true in photography. In photography, the aperture, the f, the best f number of the lens has to do with a piece of glass, and that's all there is to it. So there are a number of rules that are different. There's one more that's a bit esoteric that you'll understand later. The PSF, point spread function, just means the shape of this cone, is shift invariant, which means that it's the same shape anywhere in the field of view. And that will be important for 3D reconstruction. I'll come back to that in a moment. All right, so uh, with that proviso, we now know which rays we've captured. And we can show oblique views like this. And we can do focusing. So that may not look very exciting to you, but a microscopist gets pretty excited about that because they don't see parallax in a microscope. And when I rotate it like this, I'm getting perspective views. I'm also getting parallax. I can see the sides of stuff. So you can use it to count cells or to see stuff that is occluded by other stuff from, uh, without rotating the specimen itself, which is hard. We can also focus. So focusing is, of course, something you can do with a microscope just by cranking the knob. But we can do it from a single snapshot. So we can do it for things that are moving, live. We can do it for things that are photosensitive, where the light required to capture a focal stack manually would fry, would literally kill the organism. So there's that fundamental advantage of using light field microscopy. So light field microscopy then sort of makes using a microscope into a two-handed operation. So in this video, you see my grad student, Zheng Yan Zhang, with his left hand on the his left hand on the microscope and his right hand on the mouse. So using his right hand, he will rotate the, the specimen digitally. So everything that I've shown you can be implemented in real time on a GPU. It's just sampling pixels or samples from the light field. Then he'll reach over with his left hand and he'll move the stage of the microscope, move to a different part of the specimen. And it's all being fed into the video camera in real time. Then he'll go back with his right hand again and rotate the specimen, or he could digitally focus up and down if he wanted to. So it sort of becomes this two-handed experience to explore a specimen, whereas usually a microscope only requires one hand. So there are a number of copies of this. We have a copy at Harvard. There's a copy at the Woods Hole Oceanographic, the Marine Biology Laboratory. There's 
uh, a copy, uh, several copies around Stanford and one down at the Hopkins Marine Station. So one day we sent the undergraduates out into the tide pools to gather uh, interesting specimens. This is one of my favorites. Just has a nice three-dimensional structure that I like. So the one on the right, a bit more scientifically interesting, these are Golgi stain neurons. So it's a staining procedure that will make opaque a very small fraction of the neurons in a tissue. So uh, they'll turn them black, and that's what you see here. Um, and then this is a single photograph that we're rotating digitally. So look at the amount of parallax on this capillary here. So this is one of those objectives that captures from negative to positive 70 degrees. So it's 140 degrees of parallax that we're, that we're seeing here. So this suggests there might be applications in neuroscience. And so several of my collaborations are uh, along those lines. So this is one collaboration with uh, Professor Florian Engert at Harvard. Among the organisms that are used as model systems for studies in neuroscience, the zebrafish holds a special place. Uh, it has more neurons than C. elegans, the little worm, which only has, I think, 392. It has tens, or it has thousands. Um, but it's transparent. So you can put the zebrafish under a microscope and look at everything inside it. And so here's an example of a zebrafish. Left eye, right eye, head, the tail's down here. We're looking at the brain here. And what those bright spots are are individual neurons. So this is a light field. As you'll see here, we can rotate it around. So these two neurons are uh, special ones. They're called the Malthus neurons, sometimes called the escape neurons. And uh, this axon leads back to the tail, where if this neuron fires, it flicks its tail and it tries to escape from some situation. So in this case, the fish has been genetically modified to express green fluorescent protein, which makes it glow. So in this fluorescent micrograph, we can see it. What we're going to do over here is what's called calcium imaging. As a neuron fires, it uptakes calcium, uh, which uh, causes fluorescence. And so in proportion to its amount of firing, it becomes brighter in this uh, micrograph. And so what we're doing here is we're going to, uh, in real time, stimulate the zebrafish, meaning shock it. Um, it's immobilized. It's stuck in jello, or agarose, as it's called. And you'll see those two escape neurons fire, and then the tail flicks, which you can't see here because we're just looking at the brain. So every time you see those flash, we're shocking the fish. And then it's three-dimensional, so you can see us rotating it around there. So the idea then is we have a five-dimensional data set, four dimensions of light field plus time, and we can now begin to study real-time neural behaviors. And because we can get some parallax there, we might be able to figure out, for example, the 3D wiring diagram of an organism. So here's a study being done by Todd Anderson, who's a PhD student of Professor Stephen Smith in molecular and cellular physiology at Stanford. And so what he did was he immobilized a zebrafish in uh, jello, in agarose, and forced it to watch television. <laughs> so what you'll see here on the screen are different patterns. There'll be small blue dots moving either to the right or to the left after this initial period of adaptation to the fluorescent stimulation. So there's the pattern. And certain neurons light up. And it's a lot of light here, so it's getting washed out a little bit. We can compute a focal stack, and then we can rotate that focal stack around, because that focal stack represents real three-dimensional information. Can we make it a little bit darker? That'd be great. That was the wrong answer. Uh, that's a little bit better. That's better. No one needs to see me anymore. They've seen me anyway. What's that? Oh, yeah. So again, look at it rotating. But notice that it's kind of blurry as it's rotating. This is a focal stack. It's not surprising that a focal stack has some blur in it. Because after all, when we capture uh, objects at a particular depth, are we done yet? Capture objects at a particular depth, that image will contain sharp contributions by that, uh, by all the stuff there, and blurry contributions by what's above and what's below it. However, we know something about what's above and what's below it. Because we also, in our focal stack, have a slice in which that stuff is sharp. So if we have a slice where that stuff is sharp, we know what's here. And if we have a slice 
where this is sharp and we have a blurry contribution by that, then you can imagine some kind of iterative procedure where we can remove the blurry contributions from each slice by looking at the other slices. So it's an iterative relaxation algorithm. It's known in the microscopy literature, and it's called 3D deconvolution. So the idea then is uh, take a light field, digitally refocus it to produce a focal stack, apply this known method from microscopy called deconvolution microscopy to produce a 3D volume data set. So this is a commercial example. Here it is with the focal blur, and here it is with the out-of-plane stuff, uh, the out-of-plane blur removed. So let's think about this slide for a second. We start with 4D light field. We digitally refocus it to produce a 3D focal stack, which we then remove the blur from to produce a volume data set. You notice anything funny about that? Isn't there a loss of a dimension somewhere? We start with this 4D data and we end up with 3D data. Where did the other dimension go? Well, let's think about this problem another way. So what is the data that we have? We've got all the rays going this way, and then we have a bunch of rays going this way, and then rays going this way. So we have a bunch of parallel projections through our object, and we want to reconstruct a 3D data set from it. So does that remind you of any other kind of problem that you might see in biomedical imaging, where you've got a bunch of parallel projections at different angles, and you want to reconstruct something from it? Did I hear something? It's tomography. Right. So it turns out, and we have a proof in a, a recent paper, that digital focusing followed by deconvolution is mathematically equivalent to limited angle tomography. It's interesting, these two solution techniques developed in different fields, um, tomography in the medical imaging and deconvolution microscopy in biology, but they're exactly the same mathematical technique and the two sides haven't really been talking to each other. So know where your data comes from. So, all right, let's think about that. So, You've got 1D worth of rays. Then you rotate the yoke on the CT scanner, so that's another dimension. Now it's 2D. And then the patient goes through it. That's 3D. It's still not 4D. So what's going on here? Well, let's say you could turn the patient on its side and stuff them through the scanner. That would give you actually the same data set, although the XYZ resolutions might not be the same in all three directions. You don't actually need a fourth dimension. The fourth dimension serves to do nothing but for perhaps reduce noise. And indeed, that is true. If you have points in three-dimensional space, voxels, that are isotropic, meaning they attenuate the same amount in each direction or they fluoresce equally in all directions, there is actually an extra dimension there. And it would be interesting to think, and it's a topic of ongoing work for us, what you might use that extra dimension for. For example, to measure anisotropic uh, participating media phenomena. All right, so let me show you a couple of examples. Uh, silkworm mouth with the blur, without the blur, and now it's a volume rendering. So I could spin that all the way around if I want. Uh, this one's perhaps more interesting. Here's our zebrafish again with the blur, without the blur after deconvolution. And now if we volume render it, you can see very precise punk tape points. And that's, that will tell us exactly where those neurons are. So now when we have some stimulus, like watching television, we can see exactly which neurons fire for each stimulus in three dimensions all at the same time, which is something you can't do in an ordinary microscope that only focuses on a single plane. So the last thing I want to talk about is our new, our recent work on an illumination system. So if what I just described to you was a microlens array followed by a camera, what this is, is a microlens array followed by a video projector. The whole optics chain is otherwise the same. So what that means is that with the video projector and the microlens array, I can turn on any ray in the light field, the four-dimensional light field that I'd like, or turn on any combination of them independently. So I'll show you a number of applications. There are lots more applications that I that I won't be able to show you just because we haven't gotten to them yet. We'll talk about uh, exotic microscope illumination a little bit. I'll talk about creating little fuzz balls of light that I will be able to move around in three dimensions um, and uh, using that to reduce scattering. I'll show you how that works. We can characterize and correct for optical aberrations, a form of adaptive optics in microscopy. 
I'll talk very briefly about structured light range finding and measuring reflectance as a function of angle for opaque surfaces. What I won't talk about, but I'd love to talk about next year, is the idea of being able to take those fuzz balls of light that I can move around in three-dimensional space and using them to optically stimulate a neuron to fire. Turns out if you genetically modify um, a zebrafish so that it expresses channel rhodopsin in its neurons, which is the stuff in our retina that makes us sensitive to light, then light will cause the neuron to fire. And so if I create a fuzzball somewhere in space, I get a neuron to fire. That will cause some neurons around it to fire, whichever ones it is connected to through its synapses. Using the light field microscope, we can record which of those neurons fired and now stimulate a different one and see which other one's fired. Now stimulate another one and see which one's fired. And then you can imagine perhaps a machine learning algorithm, belief propagation network that will then try to figure out from all this what the interconnectivity is of the neural network. And so that's, that's kind of a holy grail. That's a five to 10 year plan. Let me show you some of the simpler ones. So the format of this will be, here's what's being projected on the video projector. Here's the resulting illumination inside the microscope. So this means all the pixels are turned on here. Now it actually doesn't make any sense to turn on all the pixels. We only need to turn on the pixels in those little disks that actually make it through the optics of the microscope. And if we turn on every pixel in every disk, we just create what a microscopist would call bright field illumination. Suppose we wanted only the light to come in around the edges. What, what pattern would I describe here? If I want the light to be uniform across the field of view, but angularly only to come in along the edges. Any guesses? What's that? Donuts. Little donuts. Like that. So that's dark field illumination. Just by changing the pattern on the video projector. Suppose I displayed little centered spots here. That's a headlamp, what in, in the old computer graphics inventor world we would call a headlamp. If I just take this pattern and shift it over a little bit, then I would create oblique illumination. So let's see what that actually looks like. Uh, we're looking at a single blonde human hair. And so uh, with a bright field, that's what it looks like. If I narrow myself down to a headlamp, then I get a nice strong specular highlight here off the outer surface of the hair. Uh, dark field, lights coming in from the side, I begin to get some nice scattering from the hair fiber in this blonde uh, hair. And let's see if we go back to a headlamp here, and then I move the headlamp off to the side, something very interesting happens. I get two highlights. Now what does that actually mean? So let's say that my arm here was the cylinder. I'm going to get light that strikes the cylinder, reflects off it. I'll get some other light that refracts through it, goes through the hair fiber, picking up some of the yellow color, bounces off the inside back surface, comes back out again, and then refracts off at a different angle. This is sort of like Descartes' theory for the double rainbow. We're going to get a double specular highlight. So if we look at somebody blonde in the room, we can all go back and look at Russ uh, Taylor at the end of the talk. You'll see that any naturally blonde person has two specular highlights. They've got a white one, that's this highlight, and they've got a slightly shifted, weaker, yellower highlight. And that's the cause of it. So you can see that there might be some, some games you can, some interesting games you can play with moving the illumination around angularly. Let's talk about spatial modification of the light. So this is a collaboration with Julie Theriot in biochemistry. We're looking at Listeria monocytogenes, which is a dangerous <coughs> foodborne pathogen. And here it is, uh, there are two bacteria here that have infected the villi, the folds of the intestine of a mouse. It's hard to see them, however, because everything is fluorescing in this view. Suppose, however, that we limited the illumination to just the area around the bacteria so that we don't get a lot of autofluorescence from the surrounding tissue. So we can do that just by turning on an, a few of those discs in the video projector. The result is uh, fairly dramatic. We only see the two little bacteria now and not a lot of other stuff. And that allows us to make a nice composite view where you can easily see in these multiple views created by the light field microscope the two bacteria. So spatially masking the illumination allows us to increase contrast. So what Julie Theriot would actually like to do, 
She has a dynamical three-dimensional model of the motion of these listeria that in two dimensions appear to move in these interesting figure eights and sinuous patterns, but she's never been able to see them in three dimensions because they move in and out of the focal plane of the microscope. So the idea then is let's use the light field microscope in order to look at them where we can digitally focus after the fact, and then let's use the light field illumination system to create little follow spotlights, but three-dimensional follow fuzz balls of light that hang around each one of the listeria as they move around. And there might be multiple of them in a single field of view. All right, so let's see. How do we compute this fuzzball? What, what pixels do we turn on to focus light at different heights? So let's think again about how we focused a view. So here's another visualization of how we produce the focused views of the crayons. Here are the disks. Here's the view of the crayons. Those orange spots there are the particular samples drawn from this raw image and added together to make that one pixel at the center of the crosshair up here. Yeah, okay. Uh, again, this is kind of dark, so it would be great if we could turn the, the light down on me just a little bit, the, these uh, stage lights. Great, that looks better. Um, if we can keep it that way, that'd be great. Um, so as we begin to change the focal plane, so I'm going to move the focal plane here, the samples that I'm taking begin to borrow from adjacent microlenses. That's the essence of the digital refocusing. And the more I begin to borrow from adjacent microlenses in a particular pattern, the more I move the focal plane, and the more the single pixel at the center of the crosshair there changes to one that's in focus. So the goal now is, suppose instead of extracting these dots from an image we've recorded with a camera, let's turn on those dots in the video projector. And if we turned on just those little orange dots, we would create a single focused spot of light at a particular depth. And that's how we digitally refocus light in the microscope. So here's a little video that kind of demonstrates both the viewing refocusing and the illumination refocusing together. So let me just run that video. And this, so this video's got sound. So it was a bit louder before. So the first thing we'll do is we can start loading into our video projector. And as we open the illumination shutter, you can see the word light field focused. Uh, it looks like you've got a, uh, no, 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 I've got a, we'll, we'll fix this right away. It looks like you've got a loose connection. So I'll just pull the audio connection. Let me reset the uh, video and use the microphone. All right, here we go. Looking at a reflective plane with some opaque light colored squares on it. So the first thing we'll do yeah. is we'll load up into our video projector the word light field. And as we open the illumination shutter, you can see the word light field being focused onto the reflective part of the specimen. The next thing we'll do is we'll throw the microscope out of focus by 50 microns. As we raise the microscope objective, you'll see that both the specimen and the illumination go out of focus because they're both going through the same objective. All right, let's bring them back into focus. We can bring the illumination back into focus using our synthetic light field illumination system. Here's a representation of the objective and the focal plane. Let's get a grid going and some dimensions, and let's zoom in on the focal plane. And once we're zoomed in, we can move the focal plane down, which is up on this diagram, by 50 microns. As I do this, look at the upper left visualization showing what's being thrown on the video projector. Note that I'm beginning to throw light into multiple different lenslets. And notice also that our view in the light field viewer is beginning to come back into focus. We go back out again and go back in again. Look at the view on the video projector in the upper left and the light field microscope view in the upper right. And so here I am at 50 microns. The word light field has now been synthetically refocused back onto the specimen plane. It looks about as fuzzy as the specimen does. They're both out of focus because, after all, we have raised the microscope objective by 50 microns. So the last thing we'll do is we'll use our light field viewer to synthetically refocus the microscope itself to bring them both back into focus. And now you'll notice that the specimen is sharp and the word light field is also reasonably sharp. So but I hope you got the idea from that video, how one separately focuses the illumination and the view that one sees. So what else, how else can you use 
this ability. Suppose you had an object you wanted to illuminate, and you didn't want to illuminate an object up here, because it might be very bright and would saturate your sensor, or it might be sensitive and you'll kill it if you illuminate it. So you can imagine computing for this object down here, all the possible directions from which you could aim light at it, none of which include the directions of light that go through the upper object. So does that begin to remind you of algorithms from radiation treatment planning, where you want to illuminate all, you want to irradiate a tumor while completely avoiding uh, irradiating through the human retina, for example, which is very sensitive. So I tend to think of this as sort of 4D designer illumination. So we did a, an experiment a few years ago in, a, uh, in my paper on synthetic aperture confocal imaging where we tried to do this on the macroscopic scale. So we have a bank of video projectors here, and we're shining light through a plant to a figurine. So by just turning off those pixels whose rays struck the plant and leaving on those pixels from the different video projectors, whose light found its way through holes in the plant between the leaves and struck the figurine, then we can illuminate the figurine without illuminating the plant. And that's what that looks like. So by analogy, we ought to be able to do the same thing microscopically as well. Remember, all the light's coming through the plant from this light field created by multiple video projectors here. So it seems like there are, might be a lot of possibilities. All right. Um, so the other uh, application I'll spend the most time on is the spherical aberration correction. So in any optical system, it's fairly easy to get the rays that are near the optical axis to come to a good focus. But in many optical systems, it's hard to get the rays that are near the edges of the aperture to come to focus. And if this area is optically uncooperative, uh, made of some material you didn't expect, then you'll often get an aberrant view where there is not a single focus. Uh, especially if the aperture is very wide. So this is one reason that it is thought that Archimedes could not have set the Greek ships on fire because a burning glass, a sphere of glass, would have made an, a very aberrant image. So let's just look at one of those aberrant rays. Here's uh, what it looks like. The ray we really wanted is the red dashed one there. So what happens in a light field recording or illumination system? Put in our micro lenses, the paraxial rays do that. The ray we didn't want ends up right next to the rays we did want. The ray we really wanted, the red dashed one, is actually recorded. It's recorded separately, but in a separate micro lens. So that suggests that just by combining rays from different micro lenses, we can produce a good focus even in aberrant situations <coughs> by resampling the light field. Uh, so What's an aberrant situation in a microscope? Happens all the time. Microscope objectives are optimized either for water, whose index of refraction is 1.33, or oil, which is 1.52, but protein, which is the stuff we're made of, is maybe 1.39, 1.45, 1.47. And so microscopists are often looking at aberrant situations. And in fact, the aberrations may vary across the specimen um, spatially. So the idea is, what do, we, what do they do in astronomy when they have aberrant imaging? They shoot a laser guide star into the sky. Well, we can create a guide star with our projector. And then they use a Shack-Hartman sensor to see where that ray went. Well, a Shack-Hartman sensor is just an array of microlenses. And in fact, the microlenses that we buy for our experiments here were bought, are usually bought by astronomers for adaptive imaging. So what I propose then is let's do adaptive imaging inside the microscope using the projector as a guide star, using the light field microscope as a Shack Hartman sensor. So here's how that would actually work. You'd uh, project a bunch of gray codes that uniquely identify every incoming path and then look at it with a camera. And over time, this would build up a code that tells you the mapping between a single projector pixel and a single camera pixel. This is, of course, a standard calibration technique in any projector camera work. And in this case, it told us that the optical axis in the middle here is in good shape. But as you move away from the paraxial rays toward the periphery, in all directions, it gets more and more aberrant, which is the vertical axis here. And we can use that information then to resample it. And in 10% glycerol, instead of the distilled water for which the objective was optimized, we can improve the contrast. And if you look at where we're getting our rays from, indeed, in the corrected case, we're beginning to borrow rays from adjacent microlenses. 
This is not the same pattern that I showed you before for digital refocusing, but it has the same flavor, a bunch of central rays and then some borrowed rays. All right, so I'm just about finished. Let me just mention a few of these other applications without going into any detail. If we can bring in light from one angle and we can look at it from another angle, that's all we need to do structured light range finding. So if anyone gives me a very, very small Michelangelo's David, I can scan it inside the microscope. This is one curve of the S in E pluribus unum from a US quarter. And it's a height map. So I've done laser, uh, not laser, I've done triangulation range finding inside the microscope. It's going to be a relatively crude model because of the low resolution of the micro lenses. But perhaps we can combine it with the next thing I'll show you, which is measuring the angular properties, the reflectance properties of opaque objects. So if you've never seen this video by Roger Hanlon of the Marine Biological Laboratory, don't take your eyes off the screen. So octopus, like cuttlefish and um, squid, have this unique property to change both the color and the shape of their skin. So they're from the family cephalopod. So for the shape change, look in particular at this profile down here as we go in reverse. See those little nodules? Isn't that amazing? All right, so I'm not going to address the shape changes. <laughs> Let's just talk about the color changes. So how do these cephalopods do this? Uh, if we look at an electron micrograph, you can see uh, a layer of what are called chromatophores, little opaque spots at, at the top of the skin, whose size are controlled by micromuscles uh, locally across the skin. Underneath that is a layer of very closely spaced protein platelets. The spacing is on the order of the wavelength of light uh, in this electron micrograph. And so that creates interference colors, what we think of as iridescence. And so these iridophores can also be controlled by micro muscles. And so it's a combination of these different layers of micro muscles working in tandem that create, uh, that give the, the octopus its ability to change colors. So we can take a little specimen of this skin, put it under the light field micrograph, under the light field microscope, and we can change it over time. So look at that one spot right there in the middle. So let me run that again. You'll see it change color from green through sort of cyanish to blue. That's iridescence. It is a change in color as a function of angle. So that's under a fixed illumination direction. Suppose I change the illumination direction as well. So here the, in this polar plot, the lighting is overhead and the lighting declines down toward the horizon. It's a piece of wet skin recently excised from a live squid, so there's a specular highlight from the skin, which goes in the opposite direction from the light source, as you would expect, for angle of reflection and angle of incidence. If we subtract out that bright specular highlight and renormalize, here's the iridescent signal. So it moves around with respect to the illumination direction. It includes a number of directions in this polar plot and changes color from orange to green to eventually blue and then disappears. These are, this is a slice of an eight-dimensional function called the BSSRDF, the bidirectional surface scattering reflectance distribution function. What it is basically is for any incoming position and direction of light, so position is two degrees of freedom and angle and direction is two degrees of freedom. For any outgoing position and direction of light, that's another four degrees of freedom, so it's an eight-dimensional function, how much light goes through that particular transport path. So we might be able to measure something like this in the microscope and combine this BSSRDF ability with the crude range finding that I showed you before. And you can imagine that we might be able to build models for the appearance of objects at a microscopic level that would have a wide variety of applications that people have not really been able to build so far because they don't look at both the space, the positional and the angular aspects of what they see through the microscope. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions. Why do they make microscopes only have orthogonal projections if 
that if scientists are interested in perspective? Um, so I, I think the telecentric nature of it is th the fact that it doesn't change size when you focus it is more important. The fact that you can move it to any point in the field of view and see the same thing is more important. Um, that also means that you can move things over and continue to take pictures and actually seem together a mosaic. Uh, there may be other um, reasons having to do with minimization of aberrations that I'm not saying or not, I'm not familiar with. So um, I was told that I should take some questions from remote sites in case they get their video cut off. Are there any questions from the remote sites? Um, sort of a bit of a tangent of a question, but I was wondering, um, this has more to do with the original webcam, uh, large-scale version. Might this have to do with the reason why um, a lot of insects have compound eyes? <laughs> right. So. Um, there are several kinds of eyes in insects. There is um, apposition and superposition eyes that both have different arrangements of multiple lenses and a retina, none of which are this arrangement. So they'll either have a single cell at the base of a tube with a lens on it, or they'll have a, a, tube, a, a lens, a tube, a space, and a retina with a lot of crosstalk between them. Neither one of them are this case. So it's inspiring theory, but it's not directly applicable theory. And there's a great book, by the way, if you're interested, called Animal Eyes. It goes through the optics of animal eye systems by Nielsen that I would recommend. But it's worth, of course, looking at those biological systems for inspiration. In the back. So, in a sense, what the micro lenses are doing is a selection operation to make sure that a particular pixel on the sensor only sees one direction of light. You need some kind of selection mechanism. It could be an array of pinholes, or it could be an array of slits, or a diffraction grating, or something like that. But you need to do some selection. Otherwise, every pixel gets input from multiple angles. So just having two sensors by itself, I'm not sure that that would do anything. Check one of, with uh, proper computational. <laughs> All right, well, let's see. So uh, work with me on this for a minute. There are techniques for being able to take a focal stack and extract both amplitude and phase. I believe they only work under coherent light, meaning a laser. But it's a technique in microscopy called quantitative phase microscopy. And so the focal stack does give you that information. For opaque objects, a sequence of images would allow you to do three-dimensional reconstruction using, say, a shape from focus algorithm. And from that, you could then render anything you wanted to. So indeed, the focus does give you information. But it's non-robust or potentially ill-posed algorithms that are being used to do that reconstruction. So it's not an easy problem. Yeah? Uh, when I came in, Russell said this stuff was going to be cool, and he was right. <laughs> um, Thank you. A microscope is two optical systems, an illuminating system and a viewing system. And everything you've done is in the viewing system. Well, the, I talked about the illumination system as well. But that was I mean, I had the video projector. So that's the illumination of the microscope. And I'm, I'm actually running into that. You're a microscopist, I gather? I used to be. Uh, so I'm, what I'm running into that is the ordinary uh, xenon arc lamp of the microscope. So it's the same illumination system, broadband illumination system that's used in the microscope. All I'm doing is I'm modulating it so that I can put light in certain places or bring in light from certain directions to the exclusion of other directions or positions. But it is the standard illumination. I can run it through fluorescent stimulation filters or whatever I'd like. And, and one other quick question. How close is a camera manufacturer like Nikon to, to creating a automatic focus microscope? using this kind of stuff? Well, as far as uh, cameras go, you can ask that PhD student Ren Ning about his company, refocusimaging.com. <laughs> uh, for microscopes, I'm, I'm looking more now for collaborators and applications than I am for commercialization. 
eventually it may be commercialized, if for no other reason than to make sure that it has the widest possible impact and the most scientists use it. Down here. I have to admit, I, I'm dissatisfied with the loss of resolution because of mm -hmm. you know, nanometer scales and all of these mm -hmm. things. Is there some way, I, I'm, I'm racking my brain, larger um, <laughs> lenses, you know, just to get higher, to, to increase the number of samples that you're taking or something to get it to Yeah, all right, so let me give you a couple of ideas. So one thing you can do is um, you can move the lenses sideways by, let's say, half of the lens width and do super resolution in space. If you move the pixels sideways by half of the pixel spacing, you might be able to do super resolution in angle. Beyond that, especially in the microscope, you're going to have to try to beat the diffraction limit. There's been some interesting work in microscopy on beating the diffraction limit using structured light, but not of this kind, that's sub-diffraction limit, and then doing interesting aliasing games in the Fourier domain, um, or by looking for some nonlinear fluorescent stuff, blah, blah, blah. There are games one can play, and this doesn't preclude them, so one could do them in addition to this to try and increase the resolution. So indeed, there are things that we have not yet explored that could potentially be done. And the reason not to use higher wavelength frequencies than optical light, than visible light is destruction of sample data? Uh, yeah, UV light, as well as it being, right, right. And a lot of the fluorescence markers that have been invented in biology work in the visible wavelengths. Okay. Thank you very much.